Um, as I said, I am Tom Kerr of Aura. Welcome to today's Aura webinar. I hope you all had an enjoyable and relaxing bank holiday weekend. I'll be your host for this session, uh, the title of which is Semiotics in Action, plus how brands can communicate safety and optimism in a post-COVID-19 world. Our speaker today is Dr. Alex Gordon, who is CEO and founder of Sign Salad. Alex will take us through a case study he presented earlier this year at uh, the Quirks event, revealing how semiotics helped Danone develop a new natural taste strengthening shot for Actimel. And then to add a, a topical twist on what is undoubtedly the topic of the moment, he's going to use that case study to offer some thoughts on how this type of thinking can help brands develop practical ways to communicate safety and optimism in order to encourage consumers to shop or use their services again, i.e. to return to a state of normality. Uh, we know this is going to be a challenge post lockdown for many of you, our members working in amongst other sectors, retail, hospitality and travel. So one of the key principles of our seminars and webinars is to ensure that you leave the event with learnings you can immediately put into practice. In the presentation, Alex demonstrates the relevance and power of cultural insight to contemporary business challenges. He provides an example of how to, pra have, how to practically apply semiotics to both new product development, positioning and pack design, particularly in the post COVID-19 world. And he shows how a collaborative partnership between an FMCG client and a cultural insight agency can lead to brand uh, success. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. So please do pop questions into the questions box uh, at the bottom of your screen um, as we go along. Uh, so before I hand over to uh, Alex, I want to say a few words about him and about Sign Salad. Sign Salad is a cultural insight agency specialising in semiotics and language analysis. And Alex is a former recipient of an Aura Award for Best Agency Speaker for work he did with Premier Foods on the Mr Kipling brand. Okay, I've now said enough. It's now time for me to stop talking and I will hand over to Alex. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this session. And thanks to Aura uh, and, and, and Tom and Suzanne and the team for inviting me along today. Um, uh, we're going to, I'm going to try and whip through this reasonably quickly just uh, for time so that everyone has a chance to uh, ask some questions. This is the, the plan, as Tom has said. Um, I'm going to effectively, this is a quick review of the, uh, the presentation that I gave with Sarah Dossett, who's the marketing director at, uh, at Danone UK. Um, on a project for Actimel. It was a great case study which looked at the cultural implications um, for them in the development of a piece of NPD. And then, um, and then I've been asked to also offer some thoughts um, on com what I call confident consumerism, about the relationship between safety and optimism. And actually the cues and codes of safety and optimism uh, combined together, the kind of functional emotional context will, will give us some direction about how to overcome some anxieties that consumers have in, in stepping outside their front door and entering stores and uh, a leisure sites, etc., and hospitality venues. Um, and then hopefully we'll have an open discussion and questions all the way through. So um, with that in mind, uh, let's press on. So let's, let's kick off with that, that, um, that conference paper I gave, uh, which is the shot of semiotics. Um, at Actimel and the cultural power of wholesome science, as we call it. So just a quick overview of the brief. Let's start there, shall we? Um, so effectively, Actimel identified that younger, younger consumers, 25 to 35, particularly had evolving needs and expectations about what, what health and wellness really means for them. Um, so Actimel, which, is, which was really established and famed for its immune boosting ingredients, um, they had designed a smoothie shot uh, packed with, with its traditional cultures um, and, and fruit and the, and the combination of those super ingredients, which um, was going to be positioned as a natural, tasty, strengthening shot space, which answered a lot of ideas about quick, convenient delivery, a powerful wellness uh, shot, um, but with the traditions of the Actimel brand and, and all of the reliability it provides behind it. Um, in particular, they developed a range of, of pack designs to, to uh, to communicate the power of this proposition, but actually they were concerned that it would have optimal alignment with wider drinks category understandings of, of four key areas, naturalness, 
around the, the context of ingredients and taste, that it would satisfy and, and align with the traditions of shop formats within the category, um, and also that it would also communicate strength and immunity. So actually, for one, for one piece of packaging, one brand to deliver, or piece of NPD to deliver on all four of those is a, is a big ask. So we were asked to conduct a, a semiotic analysis of the key drinks categories in the UK across a wide range of those sectors and of, of those categories, and to look at how those different, those different drink brands communicate the four key elements of naturalness, of tastiness, of strength and immunity, and, of, and of even of the shots category as well. What are the key codes of the shot category and did the, new, did the new packaging align with that and communicate what consumers understand from, from, from shots and recognize it as being part of the, the, sh the family of, of what shot drinks deliver. Um, and in particular, to combine all these together, we were asked to identify a culturally relevant territory to bring this new variant to life. So the first, is, the first question I just wanted to knit back before we dive into some of the findings and what we looked at is what, why semiotics? Why semiotics a useful way of understanding this and helping to solve this problem and ensure that there's a kind of confidence in moving forward with um, the decisions around any pack design and around this new proposition to bring it to market? Well, because as we know very quickly that brands um, are, are in a sense inseparable from the culture that surrounds them. When consumers are engaging with that brand, that, that natural tasty strengthening shot uh, drink, they are also going to be influenced by broader contexts of, of what naturalness means. What does a shot drink mean? What does strength and immunity actually mean? So what does taste and ingredients mean? And in particular, how is it being emergently represented so that we can ensure and give direction and confidence around Anything that was currently or had been put in the pipeline in terms of the creative, in terms of the product um, representation itself, was going to be a culturally relevant or even emergent uh, expression of all of those values of naturalness, tastiness, of strength and immunity and of a shot context. That, in a sense, is driven by... Um, yes, what, what Actimel's competitors are doing, but the broader cultural meaning uh, 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 that is communicated uh, within society, what naturalness means, and also how it's expressed by the broader drinks category as well. So that, so that when people look at, uh, at the brand in the middle on the shelf, they are unconsciously bringing in all of those different layers to make their decision about whether they understand the cultural meaning of the brand, whether it's relevant to them, and whether they understand the value purpose and, and benefit of that, of that new uh, Actimel proposition. So very quickly, why semiotics? Because it helps to understand how visual and language uh, cues on PAC or in any comms communicate or are, uh, are expressions of a broader cultural value system. So when we look at this front door, we can see that the balloons are, are telling us there's a party going on. That's a semiotic analysis. We interpret that meaning, that symbolic representation instinctively, instantaneously, irresistibly and unconsciously. We just look at the front door and without even thinking about it, automatically we just know that there's a party going on. That is a symbol of celebration to us and it differentiates that house in that street from all of the other houses in that street which don't have balloons on the front door. That house is transformed and its cultural meaning and symbolic expression is changed by putting uh, by putting the balloons on the front door. And we can understand that without any argument because we've been trained from childhood to understand that visual convention in our streets. And we don't even think about the interpretive process that we're going through in order to understand what its meaning is. That is a semiotic analysis. It's clear, we all agree. But when you put a black uh, wreath on that front door with the balloons, actually all of a sudden you, you don't know what's going on in that house. We're very confused. And while we'll run to that house because of the fun that we know is but lurking behind the front door, we'll run away from that house because it's communicating culturally contradictory messages of grief and celebration. And we're not used to that. In other words, the people in that house have, have not made themselves, have not made their meaning clear. They're not in control of their meaning. Often brands are communicating culturally contradictory messages. And if in the case of Actimel, they want to communicate four key distinguishing benefits, naturalness, tastiness, strength and immunity, and a a the benefits of a shot, they have to know how to align and use the visual cues, in this case on packaging, so that there isn't this problem, so that people don't look at it and see cultural contradiction, they see cultural relevance and cohesion. That was our task. Semiotics is a key tool to allow that to happen. 
One of the principles of semiotics, as I'm sure you know, is that actually brand growth, the success of a brand is aligned with and, and indebted to cultural change. And if you look at a, a supermarket shelf, you can see those brands whose value systems seem to be outdated or of the past or residual. Those brands that seem to be relevant now, but it's spotting those visual cues of the future, often exhibited by brands that may be leading edge brands, sometimes in other categories um, or in competitors um, that really reveal the direction of travel and trajectory, not only for the category, but also for the consumer's mindset and what they are going to believe is relevant uh, uh, to them and, what, uh, and, uh, imp uh, and affects their purchasing decisions and behaviours. Um, that's often crucial. Sometimes, of course, it's the category competitors who have market share, who express and, and exhibit the, the cues and signs or symbolic values of which are present or dominant in culture. And sometimes there are those brands which don't seem to be challenging us and our brands in terms of market share, but they are challenging us in terms of cultural capital and in terms of cultural value. And that's why we need to pay attention to what they're doing. And that's why it's worth looking at in this case, when we looked at the drinks category to understand not only the mainstream competitors to Actimel, but also some of the leading edge brands that are beginning to represent and reflect new cultural values. So semiotics is about understanding the relationship between signs, symbols, um, and, and, and cultural messaging through, um, uh, um, through the, uh, and how those signs and symbols bring together brands and culture. If the two hemispheres of the circle are aligned, the brand is culturally relevant. Um, and and if, a mo if, if a brand is either in particular, in a, when it's introducing a piece of NPD, if there isn't an immediate uptake by consumers, we, are, we know that there's a kind of disconnect. Um, and it's overcoming that that we were helping uh, Danon to ensure before they actually took the brand uh, and the new, the new variant to market. So what was our project approach? Uh, first stage, as I suggested, was to look at and conduct a cross-category analysis of dominant and emergent codes of naturalness, of ingredients and taste, of, of shot experience and strength and immunity, and then uh, eventually to then look at some existing um, existing prototype packaging um, and how it aligned with those emergent codes or not and to offer recommendations on how to ensure that it could evolve some of its prototype pack designs to ensure optimal alignment. Um, as you'll see they had done a pretty good job with their creative agency already but there was a little bit of direction of the, for them to travel and evolve um, uh, alongside the already good news they'd done which was which was entirely possible. So with that in mind, I'm just going to zip through kind of highlights now of, of the different stages. Um, stage one, the cross-category analysis. What do we look at? For each of Actimel's values, we identified how dominant emergent definitions were being updated to emergent ones. So in the context of naturalness, we identified actually many, the dominant codes from a lot of standard brands was to represent a kind of um, a beautiful, almost fictionalized perfection of fruit um, or of, um, a, of a sense of the natural origins of the product. What we identified moving forward was that actually uh, many of the imagery, much of the imagery was, no, was taken away and what you saw was the actual product. So instead of a representation, a dominant representation of a, the perceived perfection of the product through packaging which had photography, for instance, on it or illustration, we moved actually to stripping away that um, that illustration of photography, that implied perfection, and showing the raw ingredients in all its imperfect glory. Um, and that, that was a critical and, and authentic way to represent a, a kind of emergent naturalness. In terms of ingredients and taste, there was a kind of reference to, um, uh, to fruit um, or, to, or to a kind of, um, per, again, language which suggested uh, or, or, or suggested a kind of origin, but um, didn't reveal how things were actually made. So what does an antioxidant co cocoa fusion actually mean? How is it created? What's, what does it mean for, for how the, the brand was developed or the product was developed? How is juicy water's water collected from clouds and fused with juice? In what way is it actually done? There's a kind of leap of faith that was being asked to be taken by consumers, whereas emergently, Brands were adopting a very clear definition of distinctive processes, often sig signalled or expressed on pack and represented on pack by infographic style drawings, um, which revealed a kind of honesty uh, at the heart of the brand and a clear believability um, for the consumer in the 
in the viability and naturalness uh, of the ingredients and of the taste. In terms of strength and immunity, there was a lot of reference to physical boost, to the, in a sense, the external impact that the brand had on you in terms of imagery, in terms, sorry, in terms of energy, um, and in terms of the powerful, almost explosive impact that, that this would have for you. Um, whereas, and particularly it was a physical context. Emergently, we discovered at the time we did this a few years ago, um, that um, maybe, maybe 18 months ago, that there was a rise of holistic rejuvenation, which was in particular um, combining the ideas of strength, uh, which was both an external as well as an internal uh, process. It allowed both to align together, a, a mental as well as a physical context. So that there was that holistic rejuvenation, which was a real signal of strength and immunity, rather than merely a kind of f uh, visual imagery of physicality. Um, it was also a mental benefit, uh, which was implied uh, as, a, as being a benefit. Finally, a shot experience. Well, a lot of shot experience and fermentation was very much anchored dominantly in references to science, um, which demanded a kind of leap of faith again from consumers that this scientific process that was promised internally was going to be delivered by the brand um, and by the variant. Um, uh, um, em emergently what we saw was almost a fusion with codes of naturalness where there was a there was a clear explanation of the natural ingredients that were used but also of the scientific benefits of those natural ingredients as well so overall having uncovered those dominant to emergent category shifts we just showed you four there for each of them we provided three to four for each one um, so having looked at those shifts happening across each of actimil's four key values we sort of cross fertilized those findings and, and showed how there was an intersection between them. There was almost like patterns that emerged. We clustered some of those codes um, and identified, um, identified potential territories between the four values, which could be, be, be used to develop the smoothie shop product. Um, here was an example of that. Um, and we were able to, to the, um, uh, those are the, we've highlighted the emergent codes we uncovered there. And by, by cross-fertilizing, by clustering certain of those cues together, we were identified four key territories, exquisite elixirs, wholesome science, gentle revolution, and humble maestros. I'll, I'll come back to those in a minute um, and bring, bring in particular one of them to life. Remember, we're, 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 we're giving you the highlights here, but for each of those uh, territories, we explained them very clearly and gave examples drawn from all of those different codes you see in front of you to explain them and, and, and how different they were from each other and how each of them was viable for potentially to represent natural tasting strengthening shot. But at this point we hadn't identified which of those territories was going to be most relevant to Actimel's new uh, variant. So that was the next task. Well, in order to do that, we had to look at the prototype uh, of, the, of the packaging uh, and therefore of the proposition itself. So the first thing we look, we, we just gave them a quick overview of the pack design as it stood to understand what it communicated to consumers neutrally without thinking about the context uh, that we've just been through. So the first thing is there are certain cues that leap out at us, rather like the balloons on the door. When we look at them, we interpret their meaning instinctively, instantaneously, unconsciously and irresistibly. So the first thing is this bulbous curved shaped bottle connotes to us a container that's bursting with contents, like an overspilling sack of grain, for instance, and as used by some other brands, as you saw within the, within the drinks category. Actimel was therefore being coded as a drink that's packed to the seams with rich, abundant nourishment for the consumer. Um, another image, Actimel product actually um, contained sedimentation, floating bits, which was visible through the transparent bottom half of the bottle, which connoted homemade pulpy juices. Therefore, Actimel was being coded as an unfiltered raw product that fully retained nature's and nutri nutrients and goodness uh, without a processing or filtering it down in any way. Um, you'll recall that was actually very positive, as we'll come to we'll explain how these align with some of the codes that we discovered beforehand. But you can begin to see the correlation between them. Um, and another just to give you a highlight, another code that we identified that leapt out to us from the packaging was that the, the minimalist pack layout with plentiful negative space, the clean lines, the sans serif font, overall connotes the design conventions of innovative, technologically savvy disruptor brands, which allowed 
ActiveML to communicate or code itself as cutting edge offering and being engineered with expert precision to meet the needs of modern day users. Now, of course, this is all being interpreted and understood uh, uh, automatically by consumers at this point. So uh, that was just a flavor, forgive the pun, of some of the findings from looking at the pack. There were many more. What were the recommendations? Well, we identified overall, um, uh, having identified the, the meaning of the codes of, of, the, of, the, of the, the new variance packaging, we identified, we had a look back at the territories right, we'd, we'd previously uh, uncovered to see where there was correlation between them, between exquisite elixirs, wholesome science, gentle revolution, and humble maestros. Which of those does the, does the proposed pack design and proposed ActiML variant align with most clearly? Um, and you can see here, if you see the colors down on the bottom right hand side, you can see that that, that table is all of the different, um, as we call them, cultural codes or narratives or visual expressions um, that uh, the packaging uh, represented and utilized. And you can see that actually overall, the one that leapt out, the territory that leapt out as most aligned with what, with the, with the proposed pack design was wholesome science. So that was how we moved forward with wholesome science. So we made some very clear uh, uh, it was very clear to us why. First of all, over, um, it aligned with the wholesome science territory because the territory prioritizes skill with brands championing expert methods that celebrate nature's in integral goodness. Um, it creatively combined the rigor of a laboratory with the wisdom of a grandmother's kitchen to offer the best of both worlds. And we suggested actually that that was powerful uh, in, in these key, key ways. One, it represented uh, uh, for naturalness cues, um, the, the code, the emergent code it represented was a raw prototype, raw un, uh, unaltered goodness. Um, for ingredients and taste, it represented distinctive processes, manufacturing that preserved the integrity, guaranteeing excellent taste, um, and a clear explanation of the origins of those uh, of the ingredients and taste and how they how they were put together to produce the product. And then the shot experience, the optimized nature, the harmonious meeting of science and nature, blending the best of both worlds. And we suggested that that was what was the emergent coding of wholesome science. And it actually aligned very powerfully with ActiML's new pack design. So with that in mind, um, we were able to suggest some of the codes or some of the visual cues and language cues that ActiML was currently using that they could hold on to or retain in order to move forward and communicate wholesome science in a powerful way. The first was keep hold of the bulging bottle signs. They do a great job. Secondly, the product with sedimentation visible through transparent half of the bottle aligns with, with, uh, with codes of, uh, of, of naturalness. The minimalist pack layout suggests um, that it has scientific optimization as well, for, uh, uh, um, which is relevant to strength and immunity. Um, and also the secondary pack clearly display the product, allowing you to see that, that sedimentation as well. What about elements for evolution that they needed to adapt, adopt? So the first was to reduce the repetitive or brand health claims on the secondary pack, particularly because they overwhelmed the pack and didn't allow for that kind of tech minimalism that we preferred to. Secondly, to modify the flavor descriptions to spotlight the unique ingredients and process, and ultimately to reduce the amount of text and replace it with graphic info style illustrations. Um, and then to evolve from very functional to very informative flavor names um, so that there was a clear understanding of what they might mean and the benefit from each of the different variants. Um, the result, well, when they introduced it in September 2019, um, was introducing the, the Actimel fruit and veg cultured shots um, uh, very successfully. Um, and then they brought that to the shelf in September 2019 and with a, an accompanying comms campaign, creative campaign, which um, raised awareness and had a great impact for the brand. And um, back in February, when we were presenting this, they hadn't yet got the results totally through, but sales, for instance, in Ocado had been uh, uh, like for like with their uh, the core brand proposition and the core the core brand offer, which uh, which were very positive responses and and were rising. So and particularly uh, what was satisfying was the demographics of the purchase as well was spot on with the with the um, with the, the target demographic they were seeking as well. So um, we haven't got the exact statistics at the moment, but we understand that there's been tremendous success and that Danone have are in the process of developing more of these uh, based on the success of them out beyond the supermarkets into uh, into uh, small shop holders as well when we were able to return to them so 
And that was just a quick overview of, of a project which demonstrated how broader cultural understanding helped in very specific and practical terms to ensure that bringing a new, new product to market um, and developing an intersection between a, a natural, tasty, healthy, strengthening shot, uh, which was a very ambitious thing to combine four different cultural values into one, that semiotics and cultural insight was able to do that and ensure that, that the, the, the brand uh, guardians uh, uh, and that Danone was able and the Actimel team were able to to move that brand into market and to bring that brand to market in the UK with tremendous confidence and success overcoming some of the shortcomings ensuring they were aligned with the emergent codes and and maintaining the heritage and equity of the brand as well at the same time um, so um, Certainly some of the challenges there that they faced are relevant to what I'm now going to go through very quickly in terms of confident consumerism, which I was also asked to look at, particularly the, the values in which symbolic representations, imagery, um, visual cues that we see around us communicate um, big cultural values to us that on the surface, they may be functional objects or they may be certain things may be, may be um, operating as functional devices or uh, or functional objects, but actually they're crucially communicating much higher order um, symbolic uh, symbolic value for the brand that might employ them. Um, so I want to just bring that the same value, the same idea of the balloons on the door and of how culture is changing is absolutely fundamental, not only to the Actimel project, but also to enabling consumers to leave home and move into shopping spaces and leisure spaces um, and leisure venues uh, with a great deal of confidence in the same way that by using the right signs and symbols and cultural messaging you can overcome anxiety and allow consumers to feel a great deal of confidence so this is a quick thought on it it's obviously not definitive it's just a way of starting the conversation and we've given some practical directions going forward so the first thing to say is as we've suggested and as i was invited to look at there are two hemispheres to this confident consumerism now for us. The first is the context of safety, safety and the second is the context of optimism. I want to quickly look at um, effectively two, two key codes for each, two key codes of safety and two key codes of optimism and how they combine uh, to allow us to overcome uh, uh, and venture out with confidence. So let's have a look at safety. The first is, and on the surface it might seem obvious but I want to suggest it's not as obvious as it might seem. The first is being seen to deliver the functional basics of protection and safety will provide reassurance and certainty. And the first of those is we, you know, we know that this has been discussed in the media a lot, is the context of cleaning. Cleanliness is absolutely fundamental to this process. It's a basic signal of care and responsibility. So the idea of not only of having conducted it uh, in any of these, in any, in any uh, retail or leisure spaces, but actually showing that it's been done. Um, vis visually showing it, visually for consumers to be able to see that it's been, been, been conducted, certifying it in some way, indicating, referencing it around the space itself indicates that and gives a sense of confidence. It, it ultimately is not just a functional process or a functional necessity, it's actually signalling a responsible and believable business. And ultimately that this is about both, both literal safety, but also symbolically safe as well. This is a space that one can go into because the, 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 uh, the owners of that space, the business itself cares for us as consumers and cares for their environment. And it's welcoming us in and giving us a sense of symbolic safety, not only a kind of literalism. Um, the second, again, much, again, quite obvious um, in many ways and something that's been, that's been seen, but, but I want to emphasise the symbolic power of this, that reassuring and protecting staff and customers is signalled by barriers and perhaps free masks or hand sanitizers, which, which combines both the context of, pro of protection, but also signals a kind of bigger symbolic generosity. In particular, the fact that the, the, the screens exist and can be seen is not, only, uh, uh, is not only a literal functional protection, but it also is a signifier of that kind of, uh, 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 it, it signifies, it's a literal physical signal to us that, that the brand cares, that the owners of the space, the brand, that guardians uh, care, and also there's a huge opportunity to produce branded merchandise in this context, which again is a symbol of a kind of, that kind of, uh, generosity of spirit which which the British public have been so taken with during this time and which has been exhibited to NHS carers and the kind of volunteering force that has emerged as well. This is an extension, the kind of value idea here is 
serving a function, but it also fulfills a kind of symbolic value around safety and also signaling an extension of the kind of generosity and social action spirit which has emerged in Britain in the last 10 weeks. So there's two thoughts around safety, both of their literal and symbolic value. Let's move on to optimism. So positive messaging, including the use of humour, particularly lifts spirits, it overcomes fear, it galvanises confidence and generates support. In other words, language that's being used, an imagery of this kind, is a metaphor for a brighter future. It allows us to lift the, the kind of clouds under which we seem to have lived for a while, and it, and it signals that, um, that uh, the businesses themselves, that retail spaces and leisure spaces themselves are participants in that brighter future. They are necessary participants in that future. Um, that positive messaging and humour um, looks to a happier future and the humour lightens the tensions, creates a warm conversation between the business and the consumer so that it's not just a shop that is there for the purposes of, uh, of consumerism alone, but also an extension of some of the values that have emerged in culture so far. Um, this kind of positive messaging is metaphoric, um, it's empathetic, and it is essentially hopeful as well. I want to continue that idea, uh, if I may, in terms of this idea of capturing the spirit in, in, in British society around volunteerism and support, the clapping, for instance, on the Thursday nights for the NHS, and see how that might be harnessed and signalled for, um, for the high street, for instance, that, that actually there's a sense in which there's an opportunity to harness some of that goodwill and employ it, not cynically, but, but purposefully, um, uh, from supporting the NHS to supporting local and national shopkeepers. In other words, that, that going out, going shopping, going to a leisure space, um, uh, going to hospitality spaces, is about bringing the British people, communities and the nation together, that it has a vital purpose, um, that it creates per personal purpose and achievement, having been locked inside for a long time, shopping missions, as we might call them, achieve a sense of personal purpose and achievement, not just for oneself, but also for the community, that going out, venturing out, being amongst others is about re reconnecting um, a, a kind of tangibility to overcome the isolation and distance of that virtual interaction, it's about national, national regeneration as well as reigniting local community belonging. And the high street, of course, is not just a space for, for shopping or for functional uh, processes like purchasing or consumerism, but also it's a space and it remembers and reminds us that the local community, the local high street and the shops and shopkeepers within it are providing a function to us and a service to us as a space in which the community gets together and in which the cohesion and, and um, and, and the connection between British people is, re in, is reinvigorated. It's about that tangible connection and purpose of people, local community and nation. In other words, confident consumerism is the fusion of safety and optimism, of functional and emotional, of the literal and symbolic with the metaphoric and empathetic, of the responsible with the hopeful, of personal protection and of personal purpose, of cleanliness as a functional value, but of belonging as a higher order symbolic and optimistic value as well. So with that in mind, here are just a few closing thoughts and I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll just stop after this. Here's some practical ideas. One, it might be worth thinking about conducting that deep clean, but also to display photos of it, to, to prove it and certify it happened by referencing it in signage, to obviously screen, screens uh, around tills for staff and customers, possible card only payment, but providing opportunities around merchandising for branded masters, hand sanitizers. This is about, about literal and symbolic power, uh, uh, representation and expression of safety. And then humor and signage, positive messages about an optimistic future. And then references to supporting local community, buying British, reconnecting the nation to suggest that each journey and shopping trip or, or, or venture to a restaurant, leisure, hospitality space is a mission to achieve something greater than the personal experience. In this sense, we suggest that the combination of these will enable a kind of confident consumerism. These are some top of mind thoughts and uh, of course, delighted now if there are any questions or to continue the conversation, I'll hand it back to Tom to curate the, the next a bit of the, of the session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alex, for presentation and uh, absolutely bang on time. Well done for that. There are questions coming in. Um, can I start with one here about, it's a, a link to website design. Um, is semiotics relevant? And um, the statement is that ours is built with usability front and centre, which means lots of white with limited opportunities for brand elements. The downside is that the experience is almost clinical and doesn't allow for an emotional connection. 
What's your view, Alex, on the use of semiotics for website design? Yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a really profound question. Um, there are, of course, there are uh, and have been questions around what is, you know, what is crucial. We've done some work with media brands, for instance, around UX and UI, usability and user interface. Um, so th there are two questions. One is there needs to be the practical navigational tools available and the easy, the easy UX and easy UI. Where does the brand stand in, in, in place of that? Well, look, any website, in a sense, is an extension of it does two things really. The first is it's, an ex it's another touch point, another branded touch point. So the role of the brand in there must be, is inevitably going to be interpreted by consumers as an extension of, 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 of the brand itself. It's, the website is not just a functional space for, for let's say, for, for purchase purposes, but, the, but it brings to life and create is a space where the brand can create connection, a deep connection to consumers um, and that the UX and the UI of that space um, is, is also a symbol of the ease, of the conversational ease, of the tonality of the brand itself. If it's a complicated process, then the brand itself is signaling its complicated process. If it's an easy one, then it symbolizes the ease and, and convenience of the brand. But that's just about the UX and UI. As, uh, it's also that the, the brand, the, the, the things like color, font, the language that's used, tone of voice, are absolutely fundamental in websites as a way of communicating uh, uh, the, the brand's values, its identity, its, its, its cultural meaning, in the same way as comms or packaging. Um, so website design is, is absolutely crucial, not just as a functional interface, but as a cultural space and a cultural interface for brands to um, create and create powerful me a meaning for, of itself and, cre and create powerful and relevant uh, interaction with consumers. Ah, interesting. So do you use a, like a crosshair, Alex, from uh, looking to convey simplicity to looking to convey sophistication as against any other axis? Uh, you, yeah, you, I mean, you can do. We, we, we sometimes employ, it depends what the, what the project is, Tom, what, what the project's demands are. Um, but it's sometimes helpful to look at and, and identify space in that way, particularly if you're thinking about uh, trying to understand, you know, the category landscape. Um, that's a, you know, that's a classic, the crosshair is a classic way of understanding category landscaping and it's used in semiotics for that purpose, of course. But the basis upon which you might establish the axes might be slightly different um, because, of course, they're about um, symbolic messaging rather than cons what consumer verbatims are, but uh, have revealed. But, but uh, yes, it's certainly when, when the project demands it, it's a very efficient and powerful tool to understand the direction of travel. What, it, what, what you then need to do, let's say, is you, say, you know, let's say you find one quadrant and your brand seems to be, or, or the, the cultural white space seems to be in one of those quadrants. It's then understanding what are the emergent codes in that quadrant um, to utilize both visual cues or language cues or, or sensory cues. And again, across any kind of platform, whether it's packaging or comms or website or an activation campaign, um, which will allow you to bring that particular quadrant to life in a relevant way. So it's useful for spotting white space, but you still need other techniques from semiotics to identify um, what the visual and language cues are that are going to be relevant. Okay, cool. Uh, there are questions pinging in here. Um, is semiotics, here we go, I'll come to... Hi Alex, thanks for the great presentation. Do you have any tips for a new cultural analyst like myself to improve my semiotic analysis? How do I know if my feelings are deep enough or if they are relevant enough to the changing cultural context? There's a uh, that's a, of a question. Yeah, that's a that's a absolutely spot on. Brilliant. So I'm going to push back on the on, on, on one of the word that was one of the words that was used in the question, which is around feelings. How do I know that my feelings are right? So we try and avoid um, a kind of you know, subjectivity or value judgment of that kind. Of course, it's quite difficult, uh, but the way to overcome that, and, and one of the key ways that semiotics needs to be believable in the sense, and, and where where brand owners, brand guardians can can have a sense of confidence in the semiotic reports that's being delivered to them, is the is the weight of cultural evidence that's provided by the by the cultural analyst and by the semiotician. By that I mean, if you're suggesting, let's be very simplistic, if you're suggesting that the colour green is used to represent nature, you can't just, and that's not about your own feelings about it, you have to not only 
Uh, you can't just say that and ask your client to, um, to take a leap of faith in you. The way that there's believability for yourself, that you know that you're absolutely right, but also to give a sense of confidence that what your the guidance and, and the advice you're giving has some real depth to it is by providing cultural evidence, imagery drawn, you know, from a range of different categories. Not only, let's say in this case with Actimel, the drinks category, but across food, across beverage, across in you know, across the automotive category, across a range of different categories, fashion category, which shows that green is being used as a symbol of naturalness. Um, and by, by providing weight of evidence, and particularly from perhaps leading edge brands, and showing how leading edge brands might be using a different color hue or a different way of managing green in a way than mainstream brands, um, that's a way of providing strong cultural evidence to support your argument. Without that cultural evidence, you haven't brought objectivity. You haven't done, in a sense, the rigor that is needed in order to absolutely feel, to know that, that the advice you're giving um, is not only corre is, is correct, but also that it's drawn from cl a clear example of where culture is changing. Uh, to my mind, if you don't provide that, you haven't provided a deep and rigorous semiotic analysis. You've provided a, um, a, 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 a single-minded subjective opinion piece. Um, and I think that, that that is where the the difference lies, that the subjectivity can and needs to be backed up by strong, powerful cultural objectivity. Cool. Cool. Alex, I'm going to try and combine two questions here from Dominica and from Robert. Um, Dominica is asking, do you think there's any chance we'll move away from war metaphors moving forward and how can we <laughs> achieve that yes. when emerging from this crisis? And then Robert's asking, in a post-COVID world, what are some key signs, codes and cues that brands frequently leverage that we think might change or evolve due to our shared culture? experience oh oh that's a fabulous those are two <laughs> questions the second one is obviously an enormous question um and i'll and i'll i'll, I'll come back to it so um uh dominica let's let's deal with the second one i'll give you some examples in, in a minute but um dominica's one around war so that's that's a fascinating idea and i i think it comes into the idea that i mentioned around safety and, and, and optimism that blend of um, the literal and symbolic. Um, yes, we've been fighting a battle, as Dominica says, and a lovely question. Thanks, Dominica. Um, uh, the language around war is, is, is obviously used. It, it, it's very simplistic in terms of, in terms of a binary opposition. Um, and I think that one of the things that's, uh, it's absolutely clear, it's made, you know, you know, there's a lot of language which has been the language of binary opposition. One of them is war, we're fighting a battle against, against an enemy. The second is the debate around in versus out. You've got to stay in the house, do not go out. So there's a kind of language which emerged during the last 10 weeks, particularly in the first four, three to four weeks, the first month, which was very clear about a literal and easy, an easy progress around a bi a binaries. It's very easy to understand language where there's a binary opposition. What's emerged though, and what happened as a result when Boris Johnson's last uh, presentation to us was that actually, um, there's a kind of slipperiness around language, the debate with Dominic comes in on again in poli into politics, but it's revealed that actually those kind of, a kind of binary opposition, which war, in, in the language around war and battle and fighting, um, is very clearly, you know, good versus evil, you know, friend versus enemy, these are very clear boundaries. And I think that actually what's, what's happened is that the language around that has been eroded and the trust and faith around that has eroded. So I think, Dominica, the answer to your question is we, well, that actually it will evolve from this war or what you might call a broader binary definition because it's happening. It's evolving right under our noses because, because there are different instructions to us emerging. You can go into some places, you can't go into others. That's a slippage where binary oppositions... Um, I know despite the fact that it sounds like going into some, not into others is, is a simple message, but actually there are many businesses where, you know, sit inside, sit outside. There's actually, there's a kind of slipperiness now between what those instructions are. And so language is evolving gradually away from that binary opposition. And we, we are finding the kind of language, which is part of the problem was we had been, we had been part of the issue around Boris's last, uh, 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 discussion was the fact that up until that point there had been very clear 
pretty, pretty clear binary language. There'd been attempts at it. He then reduced that binary language and introduced a, a number of caveats or Hello. Or interruptions uh, to that, to their provisional words, which bind, which, which interrupt that process. So uh, interrupt the binary language. So I think, Dominica, that actually we're moving beyond it anyway, because in, in response to the kind of more sophisticated slipperiness in language and in behavior that is now demanded. Um, but you're absolutely right. The binary language was a very clear way of managing the behavioral patterns the government wanted to impress. Um, language will change because behavioral patterns are becoming much more, um, much, much more sophisticated in terms, of, in terms of what they need to do in terms of our direction. So the second question from Robert, um, well, um, I think uh, in general, uh, does language change? Well, look, uh, it's a much bigger question. I think that there are there are th simple things in terms of visual cues. You know, yes, the, the kinds of cues we used previously will change and evolve um, into a new world. What they're going to be, I haven't done enormous amounts of research around them, but I think, for instance, let me give you an example. Um, it, it, in our streets, we walked along our streets, windows, occasionally around election time, they may operate in this way, but basically around our streets, windows operated as a, uh, as the border zone between the inside and outside of houses. Um, suddenly they've become almost like art galleries, our streets as rainbow signs and rainbow drawings by children and illustrations appear in the windows as you walk down the streets. Um, so it, that changed the landscape of our streets and introduced a rather warming, heartwarming, if provisional sign. And, you know, the sign of a rainbow is a, trans it's a transition sign. I suspect that we may, may, we may, and this goes to ideas around optimism I was talking about, we may evolve from using signs of rainbows into signs of sunniness, um, which is not a transition zone in which um, actually, it, it, you know, the sun a bit appears and is used historically as a signifier of positivity and of having come out of the rain, a, a, a negativity. The fact that the weather in certain parts of the country, at least, is, has moved in that direction gives us a kind of symbolic hope hopefulness as well. So I can't give you specifics, Robert, but I do think that, that apart from that one, I do think there will be an introduction of certain imagery which will symbolically um, tell us that there has been a shift in behavior and in mood and uh, allows us to communicate some different values that were different to those prior to, prior to um, going into COVID. I think particularly also around community care, social support and human interaction. Call me a, a utopian, I think that brands will begin to utilize a lot of more of that and see themselves in that kind of partnership way, which they were going to anyway, they were beginning to move in that direction rather than just, um, rather than just providers of commodities to consumers. Alex, time is rather slipping away from us. Uh, there's one final question I think I'll ask you because mm -hmm. this may give a pointer to, uh, to, to the listeners. For non-semiotics researchers, what resources could you recommend to start with? Uh, books or blogs, for example? Yeah, that's great. Um, that's a lovely. That's a lovely question. Um, so there are um, a range of different different blogs. I mean, so two excellent books. One, Rachel Laws, who's a semiotician of long standing repute, has just published an interesting book. Um, and um, I've no doubt if you go on to some of the you know the classic uh, semiotics agency websites, there will probably be. I know that Science Salad has one. A very clear descriptions, um, and and you can download some papers from there, uh, uh, which which are clear descriptors of, uh, of semiotics. Um, I, I think there are, you know, um, there are also some interesting uh, books which begin to help us think about brands in, a, in an interesting way, not just semiotics, because I think semiotics, yes, is about you can learn how to and understand how to the techniques of conducting a semiotic analysis at a very basic level. But actually, semiotics is also a way of thinking. And there are some very powerful books that enable us to go in that direction. The first, of course, the most powerful one was called Mythologies by, um, by Roland Barthes in the 1950s, in which he, he took everyday objects like the Citroen DS19 car and revealed its symbolism in a very, in a very um, open way and he wrote newspaper articles. Um, uh, uh, he looked at the, the wrestling and the re what and steak and chips, what the symbolic meaning of these values are. And I think that helps it begins to help us understand why symbolic meaning and how to uh, is crucial and 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 
uh, exists in the world in that way for us because human beings love messaging of that kind and we thrive upon it as a way of communicating. It, tell, it's, it, it helps communicate meaningful ideas to us through imagery. Um, and um, I think there are other, uh, Peter Conrad wrote a book called Mythomania, which, which is a more recent example of that, where he analyzes, for instance, the, the Apple as a brand. Um, so that helps with thinking. Uh, a book by Stephen Bailey, who's actually the former director of the Design Museum in London. It's a book called Signs of Life, Why Brands Matter takes a very, a very, uh, an approach to branding, which is, which is very powerfully symbolic. I think it's a very clear idea. Um, there is a book called This Means This and That Means That, um, which is a very good um, introduction to semiotic thinking um, by uh, Sean Hall. Sorry, I've just got up to look on my <laughs> for that. They're making reference to your library. That's right, very much so. So I think there are one or two interesting books um, about it, but um, I think there's a book called Cultural Strategy um, by Douglas Holt and a book called How Brands Become Icons by Douglas Holt, which, is, which are not, they're not books engaging with semiotics directly, but they are helpful in understanding the power of cultural thinking and the necessity of power, power of cultural thinking for, for prudent, responsible and future facing brand guardianship and brand evolution. And which, any, to my mind, any any marketeer would be well, 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 uh, would be well advised to engage and read, um, because they are fill, they are filled with an understanding. All of those books I've mentioned help to understand how imagery has is filled with deeper symbolic meaning, and that any brand um, uh, is communicating cultural values. And if they're not in control through any of it, from everything from its logo through to any comms or packaging or language it uses. And that if, if you're not aware of that meaning, you, you're not in control of that meaning and it may be damaging your brand. I would say it would certainly account for any brand that's losing market share. Um, why, why it's part of one of the reasons why it's losing market share will be that it is simply becoming culturally outdated. Um, and engaging with cultural thinking, cultural insight agencies is absolutely vital to ensure the cultural relevance and future facing relevance of a brand for whatever the purpose is, whether it's NPD or positioning or whether it's comms or, or creative development for, for PAC, etc. Excellent. Excellent. I think a very natural step for our interested members would be to uh, get in touch with you, Alex, to find out how semiotics could be used to good effect for, uh, for their companies and to improve very well. performance. Very welcome, with no obligation. Uh, thank you for the plug for Rachel Law's book as well. I think we need to wrap up at that. Uh, there is a further question at the end, which is, um, Marta has just noticed that this is being recorded. Um, yes, it will be available on the Aura website. If you go to the Knowledge tab on the member section of the Aura website, all of our presentations are available there. So, um, Alex, just for me, for me to say thank you very much for what was an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. I uh, just love semiotics. I think more should be made of it. Um, thanks to everybody for taking part. Um, I've reminded you already that uh, webinars and seminars will be available in the Knowledge tab. I'll just uh, emphasize that. Uh, it will be added in the next couple of days uh, by Suzanne. So, until we meet again. This is Tom Kerr saying stay safe, stay well, and um, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.